when people wake up in the morning, the first thing they, they think of usually is, well, what's the weather outside? The Category 2 monster storm is intensifying. It's expected to make landfall less than 24 hours from now. See that center of circulation well defined on a satellite image? That means it's strengthening. The high resolution imagery that really is a game changer. Pieces of the roof were starting to rip off. Uh, we saw street signs. This is flying the, in the kind air. of devastation and the kind of damage that we are seeing all over. When you hoist someone off a vessel out of the Bering Sea that was pitching around, Coast Guard's able to get out there and safely do it because of the weather forecast. Our whole team and in the National Weather Service, it's being able to get out there, use the technology, and save lives. I always watch the launches, and you're rooting them on. And liftoff of NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System 1. Seeing the liftoff, it was like, okay, victory's close. Oh, excitement. When you see a new piece of instrumentation, you know it's going to make a positive impact. It's like you were in a dark room, and now you're turning on a light. challenges of forecasting the weather in Alaska. There are many challenges. The weather is driven by broad scale patterns, things that are even hemispheric in scale. When you have highly localized topography like these mountains, the valleys, satellite is a backbone, especially here in Alaska. I'm Eric Stevens, science liaison at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I forecast it around the world. I can tell you there's very few places in the world that have the day-to-day -day challenges we face here. I'm Carvin Scott, Regional Director of the Alaska Region National Weather Service. JPS's data is so critical for longer range forecasts. Without it, things are just wrong. I'm Greg Mant, Director of the Joint Polar Satellite System. 85% of data that goes into numerical weather forecast models come from polar orbiting satellites like JPSS. Satellite data is also critical for the economy of the United States. Just the power of the seven-day forecast, that drives the, the economy of our nation. I'm Dr. Mitch Goldberg, Chief Scientist for JPSS. JPSS not only provides information for forecasts, since it's a polar satellite, it observes the Arctic region um, up to 14 times per day. The magic for Alaska is that since every orbit carries that satellite right over the pole, Alaska gets very frequent coverage. The JPSS data, we, we like to say it's global data for local forecasts. It is circulating the whole world and getting data from the whole world to make forecasts everywhere. So you need global observations for your local weather forecasts. We're measuring data, atmospheric temperature, water vapor, uh, precipitation, um, all these different parameters throughout the entire globe. One of the most useful sensors to us is the VIR sensor. And it has multiple bands with varying levels of resolution that we can utilize, and that detail really enhances forecast, for instance, for sea ice edge. The, the kind of detail that we can see, you know, down on the order of, you know, meters. The JPSS series of satellites have many instruments, and environmental scientists use the data to study a lot of Alaska's natural environment. It's not just weather, it's not just climate. The oceans, things like permafrost, you put a road on permafrost and then the road conducts heat from the sun down into the ground, that permafrost can thaw and then your road's gonna move. And you get things like this, the uh, all expenses paid roller coaster for free. I'm Chris Holdery, I'm an oceanographer. Whether you're trying to harvest seafood, whether you're trying to protect public health, whether you're trying to understand the effects of coastal development and what that does to the water. If we're going to help manage our marine resources, we've got to know what's happening. And JPSS really gives us that eye to be able to get that information. Being here in Alaska, aviation is incredibly important. Without aviation, we wouldn't have the economy, we wouldn't have access to medical care or any other kind of resources. And that is the only year-round reliable mode of transportation here in Alaska. If you don't have an accurate picture of what the weather's doing, you can get yourself in trouble pretty quick. I'm Adam White, Government and Legislative Affairs for the Alaska Airmen's Association.
The world has changed in meteorology. We're getting great pictures at an incredible resolution. And we don't just see clouds, we see ice. We can measure temperatures, ground temperatures. All of that data is invaluable for a forecast here on Delmar. I'm Dan Satterfield, the Chief Meteorologist here at WBOC-TV in Maryland. If we have little pockets of shore fast ice developing here and a little open water, that can actually push the water up onto the coastlines into the communities and villages, which is critical information for them to know for safety. I'm Melissa Kreller. I'm the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Fairbanks. Firefighting time is everything. With the modus, we were able to find fires that we had, would have had no idea that they were even burning out there. Being able to get the data from the polar orbiting satellites is a huge advantage to us. I'm Kent Slaughter, manager of the Bureau of Land Management, Alaska Fire Service. Being able to pinpoint hotspots for fire weather, it's an absolutely incredible tool for us. I'm Sam Shea, the Science and Operations Officer for the Forecast Office in Anchorage, Alaska. We like to use the MODIS and the VIRS imagery because that lets us see hot spots on the ground. And that's often the first indicator, other than regular satellite imagery that we use, as to where some of the fires are burning out in the remote areas. My name is Heidi Strader, and I am the Fire Weather Program Manager for the Alaska Fire Service. Preparing to take the load. Taking the load. A lot of our flying is long range long time periods. So usually it's nighttime and you're dealing with the extremes of weather, and you're dealing with the extremes of remoteness. It's going to be very windy and it changes and it can change very quickly. I'm Lieutenant Kevin Riley, United States Coast Guard. Major floods in all of the villages along the big rivers have occurred because of ice jam flooding. It can be pretty devastating. What we do is go up in the air, we fly over these areas, we land in villages and talk to folks to let folks know here along the rivers what's going on. You can see all the detailed portions of the sea ice. Alaska's number one natural hazard is ice jam flooding in the communities along rivers. Floods can come in and wipe out entire villages. We think the work that we're doing is really important to people's lives and for general safety. I'm Dr. Jessica Cherry. I'm a senior hydrologist at the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center. It all comes down to one thing, saving lives and saving property. Without these satellites, we can't do it. These satellites have changed things so much that we're now able to give warnings to people in time to save their lives from a fire, from a volcano exploding and the ash impacting an aircraft, to flash floods like what happened in Ellicott City. Howard County 911. Yes, there are two people stuck on Tiber River. I don't want to drown in here, Gary. I don't want to drown in my store. Howard County 911. I have a lady stuck in a building moving up. The water is getting higher and higher on her. That's what I tied myself to. Leather and then a chain linked through it, and I was standing on this, and water was just coming over. Eventually, there's big trees floating down where like a battering ram busted that block wall out and it just disintegrated. So I just held on to the railings and I have Joni uh, sort of clinging to me. He took that phone and he broke the glass that was in the top of the door. Is anyone gonna come get me? Does anybody know I'm here? And he said, Joni, I want you to hold as tight as you can. Do not let go. And he went through that window in the door and then he pulled me through. Water is continuing to rise and it was approximately up to our chin. The water you know, already me standing nine feet on top of my desk, you know, from the bottom to that, up to my neck, and then having that suction when this, you know, the window finally breaks. I didn't just save her life, she saved my life as well. To make severe weather forecasts that are really accurate and timely, you need a ton of information from a bunch of different sources. JPSS, and it's revolutionizing things, we can see all kinds of things we missed before because of the resolution, because of the different channels. So a forecaster has to know, I'm going to have to really jump on this flash flood warning really quick. We already know from the satellite imagery what that river is doing, how much water is in the area, how wet the ground is. That is the kind of information we never had before, and now we have it. What we need here in town is a combination of the JPSS satellite, the Homeland Security stream gauges, and my cameras and have them all connected together to help the community know when this flooding is going to happen and we can become a better weather-ready nation and be more resilient.
the forecasters have much more to work with Therefore, the forecast, the end result of the forecast is much better. The satellite is so critical for us. It's being able to get out there, use the technology, uh, the information, and save lives. It's what we're here for. With the JPSS and getting this data to the forecast offices in real time, we can now monitor the fires, floods, fog, we can monitor the snow. It's really become an important element in our whole toolbox to provide the most accurate information to the local officials who are making those life-saving decisions. I am Dr. Louis Uccellini, Director of the National Weather Service. It's all connected to our mission, and we're making it work.